So given that case study is such an integral part of management, teaching and education, let's start off by understanding some of the broad principles of analyzing case studies, especially the case studies in your pre-programmed docket. I would say there are four steps to case study analysis. Number one is what is typically called as situation analysis. You need to conduct a situation analysis. There are three dimensions to situation analysis. One is to start off, I mean, different professors will tell you different things, obviously, but then my personal opinion always has been that you have to read the case study at least two times. The first time, read it like a story, right? Because all said and done, a case study is more like a story about a company or a specific business situation. But the second time, when you read the case study, you have a pen and a paper handy. Because now, what you're doing is you are taking note of the key actors and their issues and perspectives. Right? If you look at the case study, it is typically more like a narrative, wherein people in companies are going through issues, they're talking about it, and they are in the process of taking decisions regarding those problems or issues or way forward. So the second time when you read the case study, you need to take a note of the key actors and their issues and perspectives. Jot them down. Subsequently, once you're done with the basic, let's say, listing of the key actors and so on and so forth, now you start with a brief analysis of the weaknesses opportunities and resources situation of the firm. So in that sense, you're essentially doing a SWOT analysis of the company based on the narrative as well as the data given in the case study. All of you understand SWOT analysis, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You need to list them down because eventually as you move ahead and start taking decisions, or provide recommendations, you have to make sure that they fit in into the overall perspective or the overall SWOT of the company. If not, your recommendations become meaningless. Once you're done with the situation analysis, the second step is what is known as problem definition or let's say defining problem statements. Now, what exactly is a problem statement? Essentially, in this step, what you're doing is based on the narrative and the data and the case study, you are trying to distill the key problems facing the decision makers in the case study. So essentially, you are identifying the key problems facing the decision makers. At the same time, you have to understand that there is a difference between identifying problems and mistaking symptoms to problems. Now, why do I say this? I say this because the case study will talk about symptoms. The case study will talk about manifestations of business problems. It will never give you or rarely will it give you direct access to the problems facing the decision makers and more importantly it is your job as the case study analyzer to read between the lines dig deeper and truly understand what the problems are so the most important thing to keep in mind i mean this is the key to the success of a good analysis is never ever conf uh, confuse symptoms to problems right i'll tell you the difference between symptoms and problems in the next slide, right? Because it will help you a lot in terms of clearly defining problem statements. And then as you keep or as you keep defining the problem statements, what you also have to do is take note of available and missing information. Essentially what you're doing is given certain problems and given certain issues facing the decision makers and given that you are supposed to analyze all that and provide recommendations, 
you have to understand from your perspective what kind of information is being is being provided in the case study and what is the missing information that will actually uh, let's say that's a hindrance to you making proper recommendations now the reason why this is important is in your recommendations you should also be talking about what types of new information will actually help take better decisions right so all these become very important because these are like the like all these three put together is the heart of case study analysis in any situation. Then the question becomes, what is the difference between symptom and a problem? And why was I harping about trying to understand the difference between a symptom and a problem? Because again, as I said, let me repeat this, this kind of analysis will lead you to better define the problems facing the decision makers. Now, one of the interesting tools that you can always use, or methods, let me say, not a tool, is the four whys or five whys uh, approach. Okay? And this way, you, it, it, it'll always help you truly differentiate between a symptom and a problem. So let me take a step back and tell you what is a symptom and what is a problem. You have a fever, a temperature, body temperature of 103 degrees centigrade or Celsius. That is a symptom. If you dig deeper, then you realize that you may have some kind of an ailment that is actually leading to that fever. If you don't dig deeper, you're essentially treating the fever or the temperature and actually not the underlying cause. Now the same thing applies to business problems as well. If sales have gone down, right, and if you keep hitting at the peripheral level, you may never be really able to solve the deeper issues. So let's say in the case study, it is said that sales are declining. So how do you use the four or uh, let's say the five whys approach? Here we'll, I'm just for the sake of illustration, I'm showing you three whys, right? So why have sales declined? Let's say we call it why number one. Sales have declined because there are too many sales territories that do not have a salesperson. Brilliant. So then you dig deeper and then you ask, okay, so why is it that there are so many territories unassigned to salespeople. Why is it that there are so many territories without salespeople? It doesn't make any sense. Now the reason why there are so many sales territories that are unassigned is because so many salespeople have left the company in the past one year. So the turnover or the attrition rate has essentially doubled in the sales department. And then you start asking the third why, which is, okay, so why the hell has the attrition rate doubled and then you realize that okay so the compensation plan or let's say the variable compensation plan right or the incentive plan was changed because the CFO thought that that is a better way of going about it to reduce the variable expenses and because of that it kind of demotivated the salespeople and then they started leaving the company so now if you look at it your original symptom, the sales decline, you know, it is not a marketing problem anymore. It is actually happening because of a human resource problem. If you don't dig that deeper, what happens most of the time is just you, you start finding solutions at a very peripheral level. Maybe you'll just cut costs. I mean, not cost, but you know, the price of the product. You'll say, oh, you know what, maybe the product is not good. So let me add uh, more features, something like that. But then here you realize that your sales problem is actually the result of the human resource practices of the company, right? So this is how you start digging deeper and deeper into some of the issues. And this is how you separate symptoms from problems. So as I said, just to, just to repeat, the reason why this process becomes important is because it helps you in picking and prioritizing the main problem statements, right? Because in any, any scenario, you will, you'll always face with a thousand problems. 
right? In addition to the, some of the issues that we identified in the last slide, maybe there could be other problems like your product is not weak, your price might be high, you know, blah, 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 so on and so forth. But then how do you fix all that? It's, it's almost impossible to fix all that, number one, in one chart. Second thing is maybe not all of them are not such important issues. So in that sense, your five wise approach, defining the problem statement approach, actually helps you in picking and prioritizing your key problem statements. And then you make a judicious use of the information and data provided in the case study to look for recommendations slash solutions. Once you're done with all this, now you start developing the alternatives, right? So you have identified the problem statements and based on the data, right, you actually start developing solutions to the key problems. Now one key thing to keep in mind is that the worst thing you can do is make a laundry list of things to do. Anyone can do that, right? Because, you know, I mean, I, I can give you a thousand solutions as to how to make your life better. But that's not the point. The point is your your solutions and recommendations, number one, should directly hit at the priority problems facing the company, right? So in that sense, you should have that ability in your own mind as well as from a, from a recommendation perspective to separate wheat from chaff, as they say. And second thing is you, you, you cannot develop alternatives out of thin air, right? Because solutions, recommendations, alternatives, whatever you want to call them, right, do not operate in vacuum. So you have to make sure that whatever alternatives that you have suggested should fall within the organizational constraints. As I said at the beginning, that means the alternatives that you are suggesting should directly or should be meaningful in the context of the SWOT analysis that you are the situation analysis that you have conducted for the organization, right? So you just cannot randomly say, oh, you know what, open more stores to cut, you know, to deal with the sales drop because there are no resources. This case study is telling you that, right? So in that sense, you, you have to make sure that the alternatives fall within the organizational constraints. Once you have the alternatives or recommendations, you need to run them through a few questions, right? I divide these questions into four. One, how well do the alternatives address the problem or the issue as stated? That is, how directly are you solving the specific problem? Now, the second thing is, are, are the alternatives consistent with the organization's mission and strategic objectives. Your alternatives or solutions cannot be random. They have to fall within the strategic direction, objective, mission of the organization. Is, is that really what the organization wants to do? If that is not the case, then your recommendations really don't mean anything. Number three, the, does the organization have the ability and resources to achieve the goals or your solutions, right? Again, as I said, you cannot give them solutions that they cannot execute or they don't have resources to execute. Consequently, the final question that you need to ask would be, if not, if let's say the organization does not have, let's say, X, Y, Z resources to uh, implement your solution or alternative, then you need to recommend as to what kind of additional resources and at what cost should the organization allocate or procure to achieve these specific solutions, right? So essentially what you're doing is from the point of identifying a problem to the point of providing alternatives to a point where you're also saying that this is the way you actually achieve these solutions. That is the whole point of a case study analysis. And of course, eventually you write the report in the classroom you want to do a lot of that in your PG program, but in the pre-program docket case, we will not have a report, probably a minor report, we don't care about that, but we will use the blog as a way to have robust discussions regarding each and every case. So in that sense, we will keep pushing you 
we will keep engaging with you in terms of how best we can discuss the situations in each case study. That's just a way of having fun for us, right? Given that we are a university, right? So these are all the things that I wanted to cover in this video. I hope the short video is useful to you. I hope that this is the first step in thousands of interactions that you and I will have over a period of the next one or two years. And I truly, truly look forward to having all of you on the campus. Meanwhile, keep engaging with us, keep writing on the blog. And then if at any point you have any questions, all you have to do is just pick up that phone and call us or just send an email to all of us and we will respond. All right. Well, nice talking to you and I hope to see you again. Thank you very much.